Chichileski? Here. Kate Canetta? Here. Gladys Cooper? Here. Lauren Daly? Lauren uh, is absent. Um, she has, uh, there's a family issue. Okay. She will not be with us tonight. Joe DeSilva? Present. Catherine Hodgson? Here. Rich Janelli? Here. Kathy Molinaro? Here. Al Russo? Here. Amy Spolino? Here. All right, 10 present. So we have 10 out of 11. Thank you, Kate. Uh, could we move down to the recognition, Dr. Sam? Yes, um, thank you. I see Carmen is a few years ago when we were interviewing for principals at South Street. We were looking for someone who really had the desire to make a difference and to really get involved with uh, the community in a way that's going to really change the lives of our youngsters. Well, we chose Carmen that year, and um, we we're very, uh, very happy about that decision. Um, she is. Um, there's a, a good foundation here with a solid staff. And uh, it's like any leader that's capable of leading, they could take them to a next level. And she's been doing that. You know about the achievement of the school as a blue ribbon, which is really an incredible feat that we achieved. And then they, they started dipping in and looking at the attributes of why it became a, 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 a blue ribbon school. Um, they've the noticed things with a strong faculty led by a strong leader. And in the name of the faculty and in the name of, um, of the uh, administration, um, she was selected uh, for this uh, Bell Award. And we're just so pleased that she's in congratulations to her. Carmen, well done. Glad Thank you. you. Thank you. Do you have a minute? Oh, look, look, you got a hairdo like mine. That's pretty good. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> Looky there. Do you want to tell, tell the board a little bit about some of the things that you've done? Yes, Dr. Sal, thank you. First of all, I want to thank the mayor. I want to thank the Board of Ed. I want to thank Dr. Sal uh, because he trusted me and out of so many candidates, he selected me. Uh, I couldn't have done that without his support. And of course, uh, I could not be here and celebrating uh, this prestigious award if it wasn't for the South Street staff, the students, the parents and the family, and of course, my Danbury colleagues. So thank you to everyone. I've said it many times and I'll say it again, it takes a village. In South Street, I think one of the biggest things that has made a huge difference is number one, having a, a common vision and setting high expectations for all students. Uh, the staff entrusted me, uh, follow my guidance, and we have a very open uh, communication. Uh, I'm not, I don't know everything and we work together to do what is best for students. This is all about the students. What do they need and what do we need to do, whether it be through professional development, whether it be through uh, reaching out to the Danbury, the administrative council, the coaches. Um, it, it takes a, a big group of people to put this together. And um, we have a lot of work still to do, but we're excited uh, for our next step and we need the support from the board. And one of those things we can put on that list is a brand new school, but we'll get there. Thank you, everyone. Congratulations to everyone. Thank you. Why don't we all thank her? Because we're happy to have her here and have her at South Street. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're finished, Dr. Sam? Dr. Sal, you're on mute. I, I was in practice when I preach, right? Put us on mute. I was going to ask anybody else in the cabinet if anything to say, Kara? Yeah. I was, Go ahead. I was hoping you'd ask. Um, so, yeah, it's been a pleasure working with Carmen over the last couple of years. Um, you know, I think I may have said this before. Every now and then, you know, the phone rings or I'll get an email. Do you have a minute? And I've got Carmen on the other end wanting to try something a little bit new, a little bit different. Um, and wants to kind of talk through some things. And I think that's a testament to, um, you know, what, what a leader does is that they're constantly pushing the envelope a little bit, pushing the boundaries and, and challenging a little bit of the status quo. Um, and so Carmen has been doing that for the last couple of years. And I think that that has definitely paved the way. Um, she often cites, you know, I had a conversation with my teachers. My teachers were thinking, thinking this, what do you think? And so she's always bringing that teacher, um, teacher leader perspective into the conversation. And she really honors that. And I think that, that that's what makes her so special. 
Um, and I think that that uh, resonates with staff when they know that their voice is heard and that uh, the principal is willing to roll up their sleeves and dig in and try a few things out with them, whether or not, uh, you know, without any expectation of what the outcome is gonna be, we're just gonna try it out and see where it goes. And if it works, we're gonna scale it up. And so Carmen, I just wanna congratulate you and your staff um, for what you're building over there and what you'll continue to build. And, and, and we're just, uh, we're very so, so proud of you. So thank you. I'll leave it open to anyone else on, on the cabinet. Yes, Kelly. Sure. Kelly or Kevin, go ahead, Kelly. Carmen and uh, South Street staff, just thank you very much. You guys are a wonderful, highly dedicated team. Um, I will say Carmen is always reaching out, similar to Kara, um, really advocating for what we can do for unique family situations, circumstances, how to meet students with where they're at, um, and kind of problem solve unique ways um, to intervene. So I truly appreciate um, all the hard work of the South Street team and a big congratulations to you guys. I guess, uh, any other comments? Okay. Carmen, I, I, I just want to, Carmen, I just want to say to you, to you and your staff, we know that um, every great principal is key to any great school. Um, and we've learned in these last couple of years that South Street Elementary School is certainly great. Uh, we also know from experience that great principal, great principals support, support their teachers and those great teachers in turn create a thriving school culture uh, where all of our kids can succeed. And I, I just want to congratulate you, your staff, your students, your families. Um, you know, we, we are certainly grateful uh, for your leadership at South Street um, and look forward to, to many, many years uh, of great things ahead. I, I can't thank you enough uh, for your leadership at that school. Now, Carmen, if you could solve the traffic problem, I'll give you another award. <laughs> Well done. You know, the goal kidding aside, even with that, we, we sat with the police, we sat with the neighborhood. I think Carmen's always trying to dig and finding an answer to, to solve something, whether it's a, an instructional gap or an operational issue. Um, well deserved, Carmen. Congratulations. And thank you for recognizing her tonight, board. Oh, Dr. Shaw, can I just say she has tried to solve the traffic problem because she has <laughs> reached to me about that as well. So she's got a plan for that. <laughs> and I echo all the sentiments of everybody, even though I'm new, I realize, recognize your dedication and what an honor this award is. So <laughs> thank you. I just wanted to say that. Thank you. I just want to add that. Thank you, everybody. Um, I cannot do this alone. And I see this as a win for Danbury. Danbury's on the map. And I know that right now, you know, this meeting is not about me as much as I'd like to think it is. Um, we have a lot of things that we need to discuss in these challenging times, uh, but let's celebrate. This is a Danbury win and this is everyone. Um, and we're doing great things. And I think that that needs to be said clearly. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, next, we will move on to public participation. Kate, would you read the two scripts for uh, public participation? And then after Kate read the two scripts, then we'll come with the comments. Uh, the board welcomes public participation and asks that comments be limited to three minutes. The public may offer objective comments of school operations and programs that concern them. The board will not permit any expression of personal complaints or defamatory comments about Board of Education personnel and students, nor against any person connected with the Danbury Public School System. Due to the unique nature of the COVID-19 crisis and the limitations of technology, members of the public who are Danbury residents are invited to send brief comments and questions via email in advance to dps underscore public comment underscore boe at danbury.k12.ct.us. Thank you, Kate. Okay, our first one for tonight is Cheryl Rodaccio. If Danbury is 100% distance learning, please explain why the normal school day, hour slash schedule are not being followed. Our kids are being deprived of a quality education and it is not acceptable. Megan Shaw. My son is a student at the Academy of International Studies. At this point, we are in the middle of November and the children have not gone to school one day, one minute, one second since March. They left school one day in March with the promise of return in two weeks. Since then, we have now looked to Danbury Public Schools as one broken promise after another. When will enough be enough? I would like to know why Brookfield and all the other towns are slowly moving toward full-time learning and Danbury is not open one day. 
when will you start to put the children first and the politics second? If we continue going in this downward spiral, the children will suffer for the rest of their lives. At this point, it needs to be in the parents' hands. Parents should decide that the parents who want their children in school should have the option. Danbury needs to have some type, type of support system for parents who need to work. Some of us are a two income dependent family. The, the teachers are working from home and getting full pay and benefits while other parents have had to stop work and not be able to get their salary nor benefits. I don't understand how this is fair to working parents. Not all of us have the option to stay home with our children. Danbury needs to set up some type of caregiving, no charge service, such as people coming to the home to help tutor with online learning, help care for the children in the home and other services needed by parents. The parents at home who are unable to work anymore have added stress, which means stress to the children. We try our best to not let it affect them due to the stress Danbury is causing all the parents. It is time Danbury steps up and starts putting the children first. If you continue to not put the kids back in school due to COVID, they will not get back to school for years. My son is now asking why his teachers can teach from their homes and I cannot do my job from home. Not to mention they are not working more than five hours a day. These questions come due to the selfishness of Danbury Public Schools extras are not available to the children anymore. Bethel is next to Danbury. There are 83 people in Bethel staff that are quarantined, but the superintendent refuses to close the schools. Katie Williams. Thank you for meeting on November 5th, 2020. It was nice to hear from the doctors on staff that are advising you. However, watching the board meeting, we are hearing from one side of the medical community, even though the overwhelming majority of the research shows that schools can open safely. That is never discussed by our board or medical advisors. It is important to explore all sides of the medical research being conducted when making such big decisions. Might I also suggest that one of these meetings be more interactive with members of the parent community being invited to ask questions in real time to our medical advisors and the board. It would be extremely beneficial to have the ability to be part of our dialogue. I also think that it might be helpful if our board was having discussions with the board members of our surrounding towns to get insight into how being back has been for their communities. It might also help to shed some light on how disruptive their families have found the temporary closures of cohorts, classes, or schools. Are their parents finding these closures to have a major negative impact on their children, or does the benefit of having them in the classroom outweigh the inconvenience of closures? Melissa Tuno. In regards to the recent Title IX violation, ruling against Danbury Public Schools, has this been addressed at a Board of Ed meeting? I am interested in hearing what the Board of Ed's position is on this as we stand a chance of losing our Title IX funds. Kathy Snow, I would like to provide some comments regarding the November 5th workshop. It is clear that some Board of Ed members are in favor of keeping students out of school until next year, but I'm wondering when the Board of Ed is going to talk about what the parents who have chosen hybrid would like the district to do. And unless you are one of the few board members that actually have students in the Danbury Public Schools, you cannot claim to know how it is because you do not. We do not know what it is like to have children at home, basically in isolation for going on seven months, and you do not know what it is like to try to keep them motiva motivated and mentally healthy. I also get that safety is a priority, but we are dealing with a double-edged sword because I feel the mental health of our students is in crisis as well. In the workshop, I heard, I heard the district has been reaching out to those in need about resources available, but I don't know how you decide who to reach out to. What about the average student who does not have food insecurities or issues with internet, internet connectivity, but doesn't want to log on anymore and is frustrated beyond belief and about to give up on everything? How are they identified? Dr. Fong even said how important it is to address mental health and went so far as suggesting parents help children set up get-togethers with children wearing masks. Yet in the beginning of the workshop, he said he doesn't recommend students go back to school until the end of the year. That doesn't make sense. Students can get together wearing masks, but they shouldn't be in school. What about the report that Kathy O'Dowd discussed, that the transmission of COVID was not from being in school, but rather from community spread? Has anyone thought about the fact that the teenage numbers may be going up because they have nowhere else to go but to hang out in their community? I would also like to request a review of the attendance numbers by grade level, because I feel you are losing students at the high school level. And I also formally request that all grade levels be given the same consideration when determining when to go to school in the hybrid mode. I also would like to have the numbers of how many parents chose distance learning 
and the hybrid mode reviewed again because I recall it was over 50% of parents that wanted to go back to school in the hybrid mode. And those that chose hybrid option are aware there would be cases of COVID and partial shutdowns just as the Board of Ed knew there would be. And they still chose hybrid because there is a plan in place when there is a positive case. Please consider the mental health of our students when making decisions as this is not only a COVID pandemic, we are falling into a mental health crisis as well. Give the plan a chance and do not just throw in the towel. And I'm just hitting refresh here to make sure we have no more comments. And that is it for tonight. Thank you so very much, Sandy. You're welcome. Uh, next on the agenda, uh, Amy, will you do the consent calendar, please? Sure. Um, I make a motion that the Board of Education approves the items on the consent calendar, Exhibit 20-113 through Exhibit 115 as recommended. I'll motion second. made by Amy. Kate is seconding. And Kate seconded. Are there any questions? Seeing none, uh, Kate, will you do the roll call, please? Sure thing. Joseph Britton? Yes. Rachel Chaleski? Aye. Kate Canetta, aye. Gladys Cooper? Aye. Joe De Silva? Aye. Catherine Hodgson? Aye. Rich Janelli? Aye. Kathy Molinaro? Aye. Al Russo? Aye. Amy Spolino? Aye. Passes unanimously. unanimously. Okay, motion so carried. Thank you. Uh, do we have an employee representative tonight? Student representative? Hello, guys. Hi. So, it hasn't been a busy month in terms of information to present. Um, this, pa this past month, the efforts of the BOG Executive Council and peer leadership classes in our community project partnered with Do Something resulted in the registration of dozens of new Danbury voters and allowed us to apply to a $10,000 grant, which we'll find out if we won in the coming weeks. We hope to organize a virtual spirit week before Thanksgiving break, as well as a virtual club fair to allow student interest and involvement in clubs to continue. The other week, DHS converted our distance learning live classes schedule to the hybrid learning schedule, but with live classes. We now start school at 720 and end at 12. A congratulations is needed for the DHS HOSA for winning grant funding in the United States Design for Good Challenge with their pitch to improve student mental health at DHS. The PTO commissioned awesome senior signs for distribution to families last month on the 30th and the past few weeks sports teams have been holding their senior nights. Seniors are also neck deep in college applications right now so please wish them luck. And that's all. Thank you, Jake. Thank you all. Do we have any other representative? Christopher Johnson? Yes. Uh, good evening, Board of Ed members, cabinet and community members. Thank you for allowing us to represent and speak on behalf of the Alternative Center for Excellence. ACE will be holding parent-teacher conferences during the week of November 16th to the 19th. Parents can sign up for meetings during the four afternoons, and staff will also be available for meetings from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. on Wednesday the 18th. The purpose of the conferences is to address academic concerns and standing, as well as provide SEL support and strategies to our families. The staff participated in a social emotional learning training run by uh, Lions Quest in an effort to add tools and strategies to the employed during this time, during this difficult time for staff, students, and families. <clears throat> Each guidance teacher at ACE has, was given an SEL toolbox to be used during our career and life skills course. The SEL kits include activities and lesson plans for staff. Thank you, Chris. Okay. 
Um, ACE would like to recognize and celebrate the students of, of the week for the last two weeks. ACE staff meets weekly to nominate, advocate for, and vote on each week's recipients. In effort in an effort to recognize students who are demonstrating the five behavioral expectations at ACE. The award winners are Olivia Salino, Brianna, Brianna Villani, Serena Song, Kaylee Cottrell. Congratulations to all of you and remain ACE strong. Thank you for allowing us to share our efforts in building community within our ACE family during our current distance learning environment. Stay safe and have a pleasant evening. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola, for sharing the information. You and Chris and Jake for sharing the information with the board. Thank you so very much. Action item, uh, Kate. I'll make a motion that the Board of Education approve the application for the State Buildings Grant Program in the amount of $1,080,000 in accordance with Exhibit 20-116. Can I hear a second? Second. second. Seconded by Joe. Any question concerning the action item? Seeing nine, Kate, could you do the roll call, please? Joseph Britton? Yes. Rachel Cholesky? Aye. Keith Canetta? Aye. Gladys Cooper? Aye. Joe De Silva? Aye. Catherine Hodgson? Aye. Richard Ginelli? Aye. Kathy Molinaro? Aye. Al Russo? Aye. Amy Spolino? Aye carries unanimously. Okay, thank you. Uh, superintendent's report. Yes, thank you. Um, number one we have there is a COVID-19 update and Kara Prunty uh, is, uh, is with us. I thought we would have her uh, discuss that. I just received today's uh, report, which is kind of uh, alarming and shocking, but um, yeah, uh, Jerry, would you like to uh, talk to the board about the, the, the COVID report that we've been saying, the 14-day averages, please? Sure. Uh, thanks, Dr. Sal. So um, we did have uh, 76 new cases today, um, which brought our 14-day rolling average for 100,000 to 46.4. And over the past two weeks, our positivity rate is just about 9%. Um, as we had indicated the board, we are trying a weekly uh, update uh, this information. Um, you know, we're going to talk about the reopening where there are some comments that made earlier um, uh, by uh, parents that, are, that uh, we look at. Um, and I think uh, we'll be talking about it in, uh, in our discussion of the reopening of schools. Kathy, do you have anything to add to the uh, COVID comment? I know you've had some uh, situations going on. Um, yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Sal. Good evening, everyone. Um, I, I just want to start by saying to Kara, thank you so much um, for your partnership, um, your, you know, your access, uh, the access we have to you is invaluable. And uh, we get to talk on a daily basis. We meet at least once a week, sometimes twice. Um, and that is such a tremendous help to the district. Um, you know, we continue, I continue to track the positive cases that we have that we know about, even on remote learning. Uh, we do get reports every day of positive students and positive staff. I continue to report that to the state. Um, I can tell you that in the last 14 days, what we know of are 40 positive cases. Um, and, um, you know, we, we continue to track that information and uh, work together with Kara. We'll talk more about in the reopening, but those are just the numbers that we have been um, receiving from um, from uh, Kara Prunty, and then just the um, everyday numbers that reports that come to um, to Kathy. I will say to you one of the challenges that we're reaching is this contact tracing and being able to. Um, uh, really get out and uh, re to touch everyone that um, we're supposed to, that we've come in contact with. That is a challenge right now, and youngsters are not in school, but it is something that uh, that's perplexing to us. Um, 
Dave, you're going to hear a lot about, we're going to talk about some of that also in the opening. Um, continue the conversation from the board workshop as well. Um, I'd like to just update the board a little bit on the CIAC. I asked uh, Chip to be here tonight. Chip, did you update the board about what's going on with uh, these winter activities? Please. Chip Sil Srini, is he here? He is, right? I thought I saw him. Chip is here. Yeah. Sorry, I'm, I was ahead. on mute. Uh, thanks, Dr. Sell, and uh, good evening, board, cabinet. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk a little bit about, uh, speak a little bit about the CIAC, some good news. Um, first off, I want to thank Kara Cathy, Board of Ed, cabinet, Dr. Sell, for your support uh, for this past fall. I know it was a tenuous time for everyone. We were allowed to compete. Uh, our kids did quite well. We had about 300 athletes and uh, actually still competing and we should finish, uh, we will finish on Saturday. As far as the CIAC for the winter season, uh, everything is in a flux. Uh, the CIAC uh, off of reports from the DPH and um, will have a guidance statement given to the state athletic directors on November 17th. From this document, we're going to hear, we think, about the movement of some sports to a new season. And we'll also hear about some sports potentially playing with masks. To be very honest with you as we speak, uh, I do not know whether or not sports will continue uh, as we know it during the winter. Uh, there, has, there has to be a lot of uh, work with mitigation strategies and things from the CIAC to the school districts to make things work. Uh, we had our staff meeting today. We addressed the coaches and about all our winter coaches about what, what to expect. So we're prepared uh, either in either direction uh, that we need to go. Uh, but that's about it for the CIAC. We're actually penciled in to begin sports and penciled in because the board of control needs to vote on it. Sports would begin tentatively on December 5th with games and practices to begin of uh, games to begin on December 17th. Uh, then again, it's tentative and more information will be available after November 17th. That's it. Thank you, Chip. Thank you very much. Um, that's all I have for my report at this time. Well, one second. Uh, I, I have something to add, if you don't mind. I, did you say you had a question? No, I wonder if any of the board members have a question for uh, Mrs. Green. Oh, okay. That's all. I, I have a quick one. Um, yes, sir. Chip, I, I saw an article, and I didn't have time to really dive into the article, but I saw an article that Meriden, for one, has canceled the rest of the sports to at least to the end of 2020. Are there any other schools out there that are canceling sports? Or at least that seemed to be what the article was implying. Joe, you know, at, this, at this particular point, there's a lot of rumors out there, but nothing, nothing factual. Okay. Um, we, we do know that school districts like uh, Norwalk and Stanford are – absolutely waiting for uh, the guidance from the state to come out. Uh, but there's really nothing that I know of that's firm. Okay, thanks. Courtney, did you have something to update the board on? I didn't put it down here, but you had mentioned something to me. Oh, yes, I'm sorry, Dr. Sell. Um, in the last board meeting, I had mentioned um, doing a financial update. I didn't realize that it's the next um, cycle in the calendar, so it'll be at the next board meeting. It's not this one that we do the financials. But I also did reach out to Rich to um, schedule a finance committee because I recognize that he asked for some information in the last board meeting. So we'll be doing a report on the current year financials, as well as an accounting of the spending of the COVID funding, as well as looking at the impact for next year. Um, in the next um, board meeting and at that finance committee that'll happen between now and then. Thank you, Dr. Sal. Thank you, thank you. Th that's all for the superintendent's report at this time. Okay, uh, you go on to the discussion item? Yes, yes, yes. 
Okay, well, thank you. And thank you for the workshop. Um, you know, I, I'd like this to be a continuation of that, quite frankly, in some respects. Um, we've looked at the, um, the science part of this. We've, we've um, examined um, the, um, the actual uh, cases. Um, we disaggregated it by um, age, age groups, and we're finding some uh, tendencies. Um, I know um, as we reflect on, you know, where we are and why we are, why we're at uh, the position we are. Quite frankly, um, the experiences that we've had has been longer than many of the surrounding towns that are just approaching it. Um, you know, what I see from the feedback that I'm getting, uh, we are very concerned about our youngsters not being in school. Um, I also seeing a lot of schools closing down, doing the contact tracing. There's a lot of episodic events that are happening in the school systems when they're open. Not to say that our goal is not to open. As you know, we were close to doing it. And those numbers that we, that, that um, unforeseen by us that just jumped so drastically on the 26 caused us to um, not implement the, the model, uh, the hybrid model. Um, the prediction then was that they would go up. Uh, right now, they've just uh, gone up, they've gone through the roof. Um, and I think that as, as we talk to our medical folks, uh, we've been taking their advice, and their advice has been pretty explicit to me, that the infection rate and um, the ability to contact trace and all that, although is there with the mitigating the mitigation standards, that um, it, it's not the best time to bring our youngsters back. It's not what I wanted it to be, and certainly not our team in terms of where we want it to be. But um, at this point, um, um, I think it was mentioned at the workshop, you know, um, you know, how it's impacting these youngsters. I mean, you know, I, I, you could hear what the parents have said. Um, I, I agree with that. Um, as I said at the workshop, I've got my own grandkids that have had to be quarantined now. And I, I understand the dilemma, I really do. Um, but when I weigh the safety and the professional uh, recommendations, and when everybody's scaling back, um, didn't seem to me to be the right time to do it, particularly at, at this time. Um, so we're looking at really moving along and, and trying to make a decision to keep uh, on DL to at least the uh, Thanksgiving vacation time and then reassess it for the possibilities of coming back. Now, with that said, please understand that we are looking at uh, more mitigation kinds of activities, not only the um, cleanliness of the building, but um, stations at desks, social distancing, um, all of the masks, all of that there, um, along with other, other options that some districts across the country are doing uh, with some testing options that we might have. Um, with the goal to bring everyone back. But at this point, um, it's very hard for me to think through how uh, the numbers are so radically bad, much, much more severe than um, we've had in, uh, I can't remember how long, uh, to bring them back now would not be the right thing. I did have Kathy here tonight, Kathy and Kara. That comment, uh, Kara, we spoke about just yesterday about as we looked, as I said, you know, let's call our surrounding towns. What are we learning and, and how is it that, um, you know, um, they're opening and we're at where we're at. And um, as we reflect and look at it, you had some good observations from meeting with all the folks. Maybe you can update us a little bit on some of the things that some of the things that you uh, had mentioned to us at this time, Kara Prunty, regarding that. Sure. Um... What I had mentioned is that we have just been at this elevated level for a lot longer than a lot of the other districts. So while we were, um, while all the other districts are, are now coming into the red zone and we've had this elevated community transmission now since uh, the end of August. So um, a lot of these places are now, now they're seeing what it's like to be in school uh, with high levels of community transmission. Um, so if we were to, start going into school now with this high level of community transmission, um, we're kind of, you know, we, we haven't seen that happen before. We haven't, we're just now seeing the effects of what this, what uh, the high levels are on schooling with in-person learning because our levels now are 
Um, they're creeping up. They are similar to what they were. They're creeping to where they were in the spring um, and we didn't have in-person learning there. So we are, are then. So we're kind of learning from the other districts what, how they're um, interacting with this high level of community transmission. And Kathy, I know that you're in regular communication with all the other school districts. So please feel free to add to that. Um, thank you, Kara. Um, yes, our surrounding school districts, um, they are uh, in person, some are full time um, at the elementary level and hybrid middle and high school, um, some are on full hybrid, but every surrounding district has had closures, um, which, you know, as, as I have said before, can happen um, very quickly. So parents will often get notified at you know, midday or end of the day that your child can't come back to school um, for the next 14 days. And that is happening frequently in our surrounding districts. Um, and those are districts that aren't even seeing the numbers that we are seeing right now. Um, and uh, Kara, you know, I'll, you know, certainly defer to you on this, but um, what we've been seeing in the last two weeks, I think is a result of Halloween. Uh, we have upcoming holidays. Uh, you know, Thanksgiving and Christmas, people are still traveling uh, domestically, internationally. Um, and, you know, we're at numbers now that we have not seen in a very long time. So that's very concerning to me. I think a few of the districts now surrounding have gone to DL already through the holidays. Is that correct? Um, uh, Is that some of the feedback you're getting? Oh. Um, Hello? You got frozen. Um, I think Dr. Sal, the answer to that is yes. You've got Milford and Trumbull now both going full remote until January of next year. And, um, and Shelton, today Shelton announced that they were going, uh, as of tomorrow, Shelton will go full remote until January. Yeah. Um, I, 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 you know, it's hard to, I listen to the board deeply and I, and I uh, concur. I, I think, uh, you know, if something drastically changed the other way, would we uh, move to the hybrid? Yes, we're prepared to move to the hybrid. Uh, you know, and, I, you know, I, I need to say to the board that the hybrid for us, I think I want to say 2,700 students and Carrie is on here. She might be able to update me. Maybe that's changed. Uh, 2,400 students uh, um, that, that, that we requested or a third uh, of, um, of our population. That required such a high number of um, faculty in order, to, uh, uh, in order to accommodate them, those students that, are, that would be at home on, on DL, that um, if we were, to, once we go to hybrid, then we're gonna change teachers. And you know, as, as Executive Order 4 talks about um, you know, the other factors other than numbers, well, I think the disruption of, of the youngsters in terms of a, a new teacher um, coming in, you know, as if we'd have come in on the 26th, we probably would have been sending students home. They would have had, um, you know, be sent home, have a different teacher. So all of these things begin playing into the work that we're doing. Um, and although it's difficult to leave them at home, and I feel, feel for them, um, we need to find a pathway back. And as I said, um, you know, if these numbers happen to change or it puts us in a position where we feel we can safely start implementing our hybrid, we would do it in an incident. Uh, um, but at this point, I don't believe that we're there uh, for, um, from where I stand. I know, Kevin, you're on any comments? Uh, Kim or I got Kelly and Kara, Desmero. No, I'm, I'm good, Dr. Sal. Is Kira on? Yes, Mero? Yeah. I, I'm here. I mean, I, I, I can't really, you know, comment on the health numbers, those, you know, that the data is what it is and it's a growing concern. And unfortunately, you know, it doesn't look like it's getting much better. It's going in the, in an opposite direction. Um, you know, but I, you know, I will, it's disappointing for sure. Um, 
you know, Kelly and I work very closely together. We're very concerned about kids, their well-being, and 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 how our instructional program is serving them in this environment. And um, but what I can tell you is that you know everyone is is doing, um, you know, an enormous and tremendous job in in doing the best that we can with the circumstances. We have a a pretty quality distance learning program in place, um, and we're um, you know, we do have continuity of instruction. And I, I do believe that that, that, that is an important piece um, rather than trying to write out some type of a roller coaster that is happening in a lot of these other school districts. So, you know, you know, obviously we're not happy about all of this, but we, we will forge on, we, we continue to hone our craft in this environment and, and find new ways of um, bringing instruction, high quality instruction to the students. So you know, folks can rest assured that we are at least doing our very best to make the most of this time that we have with the kids as we work towards getting back into in-person learning. Kelly, anything from your standpoint with your students that you're overseeing? Uh, yes. Just to add on to what Kara said, I mean, for the majority of, you know, students, we are just working towards um, making the distance learning model as effective and supportive of all their different learning needs, um, inclusive of our special education students. Um, we are looking at a very small select group of students um, for whom have very significant disabilities um, that really um, is quite challenging for them to partake in the, in the distance learning model. Um, and through collaboration with Kathy um, and Kara, we're working on, like I said, a very small cohort of students and getting them into the building in very, very small pockets to provide direct instruction for them a handful of days a week. It'll most likely be a two day a week model where we'll take our most significant um, special education uh, self-contained programs and bring in half the class on a Monday, Tuesday and the other half the class on a Thursday, Friday to be able to provide them with some in-person uh, specialized instruction and related services while still keeping the health and safety protocols in place for our staff and students. Um, so we're looking to possibly roll that out right after the Thanksgiving um, break. Um, and Kathy, Kara, and myself are working very, very closely to make sure um, that we're putting all the appropriate mitigation strategies in place. Um, so that will mean some of your um, some of your um, special education related services staff um, will be coming in um, during that time frame in order to provide support and services to these children. So I am um, excited about doing that. I think it's the right thing to do for our kids. Um, but it is, like I said, a very small group. Um, I wish I could do it for more, but with the numbers, um, it's not uh, not appropriate to do so at this time. Um, so we will um, continue to keep you posted on how that goes. Dr. Sal, can I just make one more comment? Yeah, go ahead. Just, it's just to address one of the uh, parental questions that came up in the beginning. Um, there was a parent who asked about um, you know, why, why we don't have a full day of school in a digital environment. And I just wanted to point out, um, you know, there's a good portion of the day, particularly K-5, and I, I believe that's where the comment was directed at. Um, when, when you eliminate recess, lunch, breaks, transitions, and independent practice from the school day, um, you know, there, there is, you know, there, there is not a need to have students in from an eight to three on a full day. Um, it, real school, when you're in school, uh, for example, in, a, in an hour block of time, a teacher could rotate through small group instruction with a group of students, um, do three groups, 20 minutes at a time. Those other two groups are in the classroom working on independent, independent work and practice uh, while they're waiting to meet their teacher for a 20 minute group. So. Um, those are just normal things that happen during the school day that may or may not be as transparent as they are now in this distance learning environment. Um, and so, you know, that's where maybe some of those questions are coming from. Um, additionally, you know, the, the length of time of the school day and the amount of direct instruction is, is appropriate. Um, and we also have to understand, too, that everything takes longer in distance learning. Um, all the lessons, everything that we normally do um, takes longer. It takes longer for teachers to develop those lessons. It takes longer. There's a lot of curriculum conversion happening right now. And what that is, is just lessons that would normally um, be delivered at the drop of a hat in a classroom have to be converted into a digital environment. Teacher has to plan for how they're going to, um, to capture information, how they're going to display information, how they're going to make it accessible to students in a digital environment, and also how they're going to um, facilitate feedback in that environment. And the planning that that takes just definitely takes longer. So there is some time embedded at the end of the day for that, as well as to reach independent, uh, independently some students who may need some, uh, uh, some additional time in, in this particular environment. So 
um, I just wanted to point that out that there's, you know, the day is very complex, the lessons are complex, and um, the work that the students are doing is right now is, is very appropriate to, to their needs. Is that, uh, there's any plan, uh, time spent with faculty expected to do, um, I mean, you, you know, in my, in my view, it's five days a week, basically, that they should be getting continuity of the instruction. Mm -hmm. On a hybrid, we're down, as you know, as you know, would be down to two, or two, two and a half days of getting, um, you know, that contact time. So, you know, um, you know, just breaking that cycle right now, thinking uh, that we would have to send students back really um, does not set well with the instructional uh, pacing of the curriculum at this point, particularly coming to the end of a marking period. All these things are playing into factor into what we're doing. And for the board, you know, I hear the word political. I don't know what that means. Um, if it's political means to try to listen to both sides and, you know, make a decision based on um, the, the best data that I can, then okay. But there's no influence as I could see in any, any, any way um, that would, would say it's, it's, it's a, a political type decision. Um, we, um, um, I don't know districts around us, you know, making decisions with so many youngsters out. I, I'm, I'm not there. Um, I'm not willing to take that risk. Maybe some people are. Um, that, that, that's just my, my take on it. Um, I, I am somewhat conservative on that. Um, and I do believe our medical folks, when they look at me in the eye and say, it's too dangerous. Knowing quite well, I want them to come back, knowing quite well the discomfort that's causing in the homes with um, you know, supervision. And the, um, the, although we work at social and emotional, it's good when the kids interact with each other. All these things come into play. And even with all of that, I can't look the board in the eye and say, at this point, I would bring them back and guarantee you that, um, you know, it'd be a, a safe environment. Uh, yeah, we do our best. We'd have our mitigation, but I think the risk uh, and reward is uh, not, not worth it at this point for me. So I'm, I'm interested to listen to the board. Um, I'm very interested. I, I listened deeply the other night. Um, you know, that's why, um, you know, we want to look at this regularly and make several changes that we can bring them back, but um, because we've been asked for communication purposes, try to give parents uh, a good lead time for planning. We think we need to at least, the team felt very strongly that we should tell parents, look, you know, we'll look at this right about Thanksgiving to see what, what we can do about the return. I think Joe mentioned something about sports. Um, you know, I don't see how we're going to be able to do that, quite frankly, based on what I'm seeing at this point as well. This is not just, um, you know, when we were in the DL before, the numbers were different. Now, you know, they're, they're at the point where I worry about that. So, uh, you know, all that is going to be in front of us moving forward. Um, and, you know, I'll come down and I'll come down on the safety. So, um, I don't know, before I just keep quiet here, I, I don't know if anybody else, Kara uh, or uh, Kim, do you have any comments or Kevin? No, I, the only thing I'll, I'll say just is is to let people know that, you know, we continue to field a lot of questions and concerns and we're starting the slow process of kind of peeling back in person work for a lot of our folks. Um, we're starting to be stretched a little bit with quarantining. Um, and so it seems like the peel back now is is a really prudent approach, not only to respond to the concerns that are coming to us, but just for staffing. So. Um, I think that you know people have been very um, flexible and um, very kind in their approach um, and very concerned, obviously, about the numbers that we're all watching. So um, we started that process yesterday afternoon, and that'll run kind of through this week. Um, so we're kind of making adjustments now for what the next couple of weeks will look like. Are there any questions from board members to Dr. Sal or anyone? Madam Chair? Yes, Joe. Um, thank you, Dr. So. Um, just a comment to the parents. We hear you. I certainly understand. I have a third grader and a sixth grader. Um, this isn't easy on anybody. We're lucky we have family support that, that helps. Um, but doctor, I think, Dr. So, I have to agree with you. I think the numbers, and our doctor said this last week during our workshop, the numbers aren't good. And frankly, they're worse today than they were last week, profoundly worse. I did, while we were, ha well, before our meeting, I was just looking and getting ready for the meeting. I looked around. If you look at the front webpage for the Norwalk Hour, the Danbury News Times and the Hartford Current, 
there are stories about schools being closed and not necessarily entire districts, although Norwalk and Darien are certainly on distance learning. Shelton's closed for the rest of the year. Um, Wallingford Middle School is closed. Uh, Manchester has a closing. Enfield has issues. West Haven High School has an issue. Middletown has an issue. I believe they're also canceling uh, canceled sports. Bethel, Brookfield, Newton, and Milford all have positive cases and some closures. Um, that may not whole schools, maybe classes or cohorts. Um, two high schools in Hartford. Uh, New Canaan, I remember reading an article yesterday in the Norwalk Hour when I was at work. New Canaan, Saks Middle School's got a major outbreak and a problem. This is happening everywhere. These schools are going in and coming out and bouncing back and forth. And I think I have to agree with Kathy O'Dowd, the disruption that's going to cause might actually be worse than being out on top of risking the safety of staff and students. So I, I want kids to go back. My son especially would really like to go back. It's hard being th in third grade and being home, but to do it now with these numbers is just, I think would be reckless, uh, not, not even dangerous, just flatly reckless. Um, I, and I think it's only a matter of time before more schools come in our direction than go in the other. Unfortunately, it's not a good situation, but I think you're on the safety side. Um, this is a question on top of that. Maybe it's for Kathy. When, when, we're clo when schools are closing classes or cohorts, how long are they closing those down for? Is that a 14 day shutdown? Um, yes, Joe, generally it is. So if there's a positive case um, and there are uh, direct contacts identified, um, we're required to close um, quarantine for 14 days and get a COVID test. Um, even if the test comes back negative, you cannot test out of quarantine you must remain in that quarantine for 14 days. Now, for direct contacts, I'm thinking for a, for a child, for a kid in the classroom. Does the direct contacts include at all of the kids in the classroom? Um, so direct contact or close contact, we uh, define that as within six feet of distance for 15 minutes or more. And it, it's not one block of time, it's actually 15 minutes, can be over a 24 hour period. So it's effectively the whole class. Yeah, it's very hard to, you know, have a, a diameter where you can say, we know only these children were within that, that six feet of distance. It's very, Is it all that's difficult. So the majority of districts, yes, are closing an entire classroom or a cohort. Is it also their school bus? The school bus, yes, that, okay. that too. You know, it's so this expands beyond high. just the classroom. Okay. Um, Yep. It Thank you. School bus as well, and that you know, children on the bus are not necessarily from the same classroom, so you would be dealing with um, other issues there as well. Okay. And we've Thank seen you. that in our non-public schools, uh, where we have had to close perhaps one grade, but then when you get to the school bus, that may involve several other grades. You know, when they, when it's the other grades, it's an individual student, not necessarily correct. the class. Okay. That's correct. Yeah. Thank you. That's all I had for this at this time, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a question. Yes, uh, Rachel. And also just a comment to Joe's, you know, statement about other surrounding towns having gone back. I wish we were one of the districts that had flip-flopped. I think it's worth, I want my kids to have just one day, one day to make a connection with their, their new teachers, their new schools, um, you know, I wouldn't send them with our numbers being what they are right now, but I would send them in September. I would have sent them in October. You know, in hindsight, I feel like we missed our opportunity. We missed our chance for our kids to have that one day. Um, and we, and does anybody else find it ironic that Chip just, you know, spoke about our kids playing sports this whole time? And then Kathy O'Dowd immediately saying, "There's it has it's about Halloween." I had ten kids come to the house for um, trick or treating, ten. Um, and I know you know there are other leagues, independent leagues that are um, you know playing, maybe not any longer with the um, governor's new rules. Um, I I just you know is there anything? tied to sports um, and 
you know, even, even through the independent leagues, you know, we know that most of those kids are our students and the, and, you know, the optics of that. Um, I don't know. And I get, you know, the staffing issue as well um, with, with, you know, our, our Danbury staff having kids in other surrounding towns, but that means their kids get to go, but ours doesn't. I don't think that's, you know, that's fair either. Um, I guess I'll just, I'll leave it at that. You know, Rachel, I, I'm not, I'm just, just a reflection. And here's what I was struggling with. Uh, you know, what do I have to take away from folks to take away from folks? If it's, if it's, if I don't have to. And, and that was the struggle that we had. And when we looked at what our youngsters were, were already, were missing out on, um, you know, we felt that with safety and the way we could handle the, um, the high school situation, which started in July, made sense to us. It's not that we didn't come close to pulling it. We did in the beginning when the numbers were at the point when we, when we didn't have it, you may recall that, and then felt that when the numbers leveled, it was okay to maintain it so long as we, we had that weekly check. And, uh, but that's, that was the dilemma. I think you just, you know, you the head, you know, on the head. You know, we had surrounding towns going and uh, I had an opportunity to get, let our kids do something and try not to just take everything away from them, which, which hurts everyone. So it's, it's, it's a fine line. And, um, you know, in retrospect, could we have, I think Kara spoke to it well, our numbers were to the point where we felt it was not safe. When we did decide in October, um, you know what happened. You know, um, that's, the, that's the only comment I have with that. I, I do understand, I do understand. I just also want to add about the Halloween thing. Um, a lot of it might not be uh, associated with trick or treating, but there were a lot of small Halloween gatherings and we're finding that in our contact tracing that we do have a lot of cases that are linked to Halloween. And, um, you know, it's 10, right now we're 10 days out and we've seen our largest spike. So we have to kind of think that there is some sort of association with Halloween. And also to, sorry, to mention, we are seeing cases with sports as well. We're seeing both. Kara, are we seeing transmission? I was looking at the numbers in school. Is that transmission, you know, there was this theory where the transmission was not happening at school. Are you, are you seeing some of that now coming with our youngsters? With our school or? No, in, in general, school age student, children, transmission. With school age kids or school transmission within like our non public schools? Well, we have our non publics. We have, yeah, yes, that's what I was talking about. Because uh, I'll defer to Kathy on this one. She's been more involved with the non public schools. Um, I can tell you what the level, the numbers of kids that we have, and that's the age breakdown that we kind of went through at the mm -hmm. uh, last meeting. But in terms of the specific contact tracing within the non public schools, I think Kathy would be better able Kathy, to. Kathy, how is that going? Maybe that. Um, so in terms of the non-public schools at this point, we have not seen the spread in schools, but we have seen um, frequent closures of either a grade level or a classroom. Um, and with the community numbers, what they are now, um, you know, my concern is that it's, it's just a matter of time. Uh, we're seeing spread through families. It's not just um, one parent or one child in the family. We are seeing... Um, all family members um, being tested positive. So um, again, I, I can't confirm that we're seeing the spread in the schools, but the numbers, you know, it's just a matter of time with what we're seeing at this point. So um, that's, we're planning on sending something out to parents so that they are able to plan, um, you know, uh, probably uh, tomorrow or Thursday. To, to alert them that uh, we'll probably be close to Thanksgiving when we'll make a decision about going forward. From um, so. I have a question. Yes. Um, Catherine. So my question is, and are on all these levels of positive cases, are they symptomatic, asymptomatic? I mean, you're saying that a whole family's coming positive, but are they all just transmitting it or do they actually have it? Or do we know? No, 
so when I say it's spreading through families, um, that is with confirmed positive cases. Um, now, positive cases can be asymptomatic. Um, they can be symptomatic, but we are seeing uh, confirmed cases of spread through families through testing. Are there any other questions? Okay, Dr. Sayer. Uh, you finished, Dr. Sayer? Yes, uh, thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, we have the uh, information uh, package. Uh, remind board members that sign up for the CAVE convention. You have the outline. Uh, we have our next board meeting on uh, November the 24th, okay, which is a Tuesday, okay. And I also had a discussion with Mr. Watson and, and, and would like to talk about having, um, I don't know if we want to name it a workshop, but an open meeting with parents so uh, we can have uh, a discussion about uh, reopening and more or less the information that we went through tonight briefly and more or less uh, to have the view or the question for the parents because most of the comments are coming in that you know we only hear on one side the board you know board members don't have kids in school and uh, that's not true we, most of us that are sitting up here we might not have children in school some of the younger ones but some of the older ones we have grandchildren in school so, you know, just have an overall discussion uh, as we look towards uh, January and um, just have a discussion with the parents and community people. Uh, so I don't know how Dr. Sell and Mr. Watson sort of feel about that, but I sort of threw a date out December the 9th. We will get started uh, maybe a little bit early, like 6.30 or 7, whichever one that's convenient for board members. Uh, that's all I want to throw out to the board. And, and uh, I think that we sort of owe it to the parents to sort of let them voice their op opinion versus the comments part. So I don't know how board members feel about that. Madam Chair? Yes. A comment, please. Uh, an open discussion. Uh, I've also read the communications that have come in and alternate view of science that um, my question to the cabinet, I am not going to argue with Dr. Fong or any medical uh, opinion says that we should stay closed. Uh, but there has been comment about additional or different uh, medical opinions. And before we have this open discussion, I would just like to have the cabinet and myself well versed on what that additional uh, that descending op medical opinions are, if there are any, and, and we know there are, and um, so we can we can talk intelligently with the parents and and, and uh, to give them our point of view that yes, the numbers are high, it's dangerous, um, and we see it school closures and partial closures all over Connecticut. And uh, I just, we should be well, as well informed as uh, uh, the others. And I understand that uh, if we all did the research, we would have be privy to it, but uh, it is a lot deeper sometimes than we have time for. And we rely on our own medical experts. So if there is a dissenting opinion out there, uh, medical opinion on what to do, uh, we should think about it or, or research it also. But I have, I am not taking any opposition against uh, Dr. Fong, or Dr. Begg. And I just uh, wanted to make that comment if you want to open this up to the public for discussion, what we're going to be opening ourselves up to. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Al. Any other comments? Our board members in favor of having uh, this uh, uh, discussion. I don't know what we want to call it, a uh, workshop, but we work out the details. It's an excellent idea. 
Okay. Yeah, I agree. So I I was looking at December, you know, uh, December the ninth. I stated it again. And those, you know, it's not mandatory board members that want to come. You can come and be a part of it. But I think it will also give the parents uh, a better idea as to uh, planning. And uh, we don't want them to, uh, we find out something and then their their plans are totally different. So I, to me, you know, if so I'm around, I Gladys, will, will the doctors be on with um, when we have the parents' comments? And yeah. will, I mean, the only thing we can go by is this addendum four, correct? Right. Yeah. This is this is our Bible, I guess, for mm -hmm. keeping kids out of school. Mm -hmm. So, will the doctors be able to be on with us? Well, we could we could talk to them. Sure, sure. I think we can. I think you know we we got something today. There's articles out there regarding, um, you know, the, the perspective of this is the norm. Um, you know, you practice keeping your hands clean. You practice masks, mm -hmm. and you practice distancing. And as you discover uh, cases, you then cohort them and remove them. And you know how dangerous is it? Uh, is uh, you know what is the um, what, what's the impact in terms of their uh, their health? Um, there's there's questions about long term health, particularly comp uh, those that are compromised. There's 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 a lot of issues. So, you know, maybe um, we could we could. Well, know, there's also them, going to, there's to. also going to be questions about the vaccine, and and will they be Ooh. able to address that? And Kara. It's a good question. And Kathy, um, are, are we are we going are we going to um, I mean, what do we know about the vaccine for Danbury, for instance? What do we know? What do we know from, will it be available in January? Um, Kara Prunty, you may Kara have some information, or Kathy, yeah. Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, we are doing our mass vaccination planning now. We're in constant communication with our regional partners, our all of our partners and the state. Um, so what the word that we got today, we actually got a memo today and they said, be prepared for December, 2020. Um, it's going to be very, very limited doses. So we, there's a priority schedule that is for that. And first and foremost are healthcare workers and hospital employees. Um, and then there's a tiered approach to that uh, with critical infrastructure and, um, and they're deciding on whether or not um, what the level of that would be for schools. Um, so at this point, that's all we know, um, but we are planning on it. They did tell us today, plan on December 2020. I don't know what that means or how many doses, um, but that is the information that we got. Yeah, I, I did too, Kathy. Um, we were asked a couple of weeks ago to start gathering numbers. So we've actually already sent categorized numbers of staff to the city um, so that they can use those numbers in their planning um, without prioritizing, but just giving them kind of overall numbers mm -hmm. so that they'll be ready with what they need when the plan's ready to go. Thank you. Okay. So we'll move forward to December the ninth. Uh, and um, Cam and Mr. Lawson and Dr. Sale will come up if we, how to really, uh, up to this and and uh, have this meeting and more or less to get parents and hear their voice okay uh i don't have anything else okay. if everybody is uh don't, if there's no other question i'll entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting so moved moved by mr de silva could i hear a second Second. Second by Al. That was Joe Britton. Joe Britton. Joe Britton. Okay. Uh, motion so carried. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.